Uh, member, Mr. Bobulinski, do you know who Elections LLC is? Yeah. Mark. Well, it's not a who. Okay. Well, do you know what it is? Yes, it's a LLC. Okay. And is it the LLC that your attorney works for? Uh, I believe so, yes. You believe so. Okay. Um, so at this point in time, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a document indicating that the law firm representing Tony Bobolinski was paid $10,000 as recently as January of this year by the Save America PAC, which you may recognize as Donald Trump's PAC. Without objection. Thank you. Now, so far in this hearing, it has felt like the worst episode of The Apprentice. I'm sure you're familiar with that show. It seems like my colleagues and maybe you and some others are trying to become the next vice president of the United States of America. You're auditioning or something like that because, Mr. Bobolinski, I know that you take exception to the fact that your credibility has been called into question over and over. But when someone comes to testify under oath, whether it's before this committee, behind closed doors, or in person, then we have to evaluate someone's credibility. And sir, I definitely have always had issues with your credibility, as I know that you are very well aware of. So let me remind you of well, what you, happened behind <coughs> closed doors. I well, you should asked, ask Roe Khan about my credibility. I haven't asked credibility. you a question. Okay? You are? When I, I haven't. So oh, when okay, I ask I'm you a sorry. question, that's when you answer. Otherwise, I'm talking. So Excuse me? with my time, because it's my time, I want to be clear that when we were behind closed doors, you called a number of people liars. You called the Wall Street Journal liars. You called Cassidy Hutchison a liar. You called yes. the FBI a liar. You called Rob Walker a liar. You called James Gillier a liar. You called Hunter Biden a liar. You called Jim Biden a liar. And just today, you added to your list, you called my colleague, Congressman Mr. Goldman, a liar as well. It seems like, according to you, the only person that's telling the truth is you and everyone else is lying. But I want to move on to something else. Is that a question? It's or? not a question. Okay. You'll know when I ask you a question, I promise. Thank you. So, the other thing that I want to talk about is um, the fact that my colleague from the other side of the aisle talked about the company that we keep. And she wanted to go through a list of people that she felt like were bad company because right now, now, the majority has been relying upon the testimony of someone who's currently sitting in federal prison. And we know that your company is the company of somebody who's been found liable of fraud, uh, as well as defamation, as well as sexual uh, assault, and for whatever reason, can't pay his bills uh, at this point in time. But I'm going to ask Mr. Parnas, so this is a question to him. Are you aware if Trump had any associates that have been found guilty of anything? Yes, lots of them. Lots of them. Me included. You included. Okay, so when you were called here to testify, you weren't called here to testify for any other reason than to tell the truth. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, Congresswoman. Now, we started this whole sham off because of the 1023. And that was debunked by you, was it not? Yes, Congresswoman. Way before we started this impeachment inquiry. And you mentioned a number of times this guy by the name of Rudy Giuliani. Yes. Now, you know, everybody is so stressed about the fact that Hunter ain't here today. But, you know, Hunter came and testified behind closed doors for over six hours. And every single one of them, they weren't limited to five minutes. They could ask whatever they wanted to. And there is a full transcript of his testimony. So I don't know what else they wanted to do besides the fact that they wanted to put on the show. But let me tell you something. This whole thing is based upon something that Giuliani came up with. Yes. And, and we tried to subpoena him if I'm... That's what I remember. If anybody else remember, We tried. We asked. We said, hey, we should subpoena Giuliani. But, you know, kind of like when we were trying to get his cell phone, they shut it down, right? Like, they don't want the facts. But you would agree with me that considering the fact that you were working under Rudy Giuliani at the time that you went over to Ukraine, that he has maybe some valuable information that he could offer this committee as to whether or not there's anything that we should be investigating in the first place. 
Absolutely, Congresswoman. I wish that this committee would subpoena Rudy Giuliani, put him under oath alongside me to get to the bottom of the truth of what actually happened in Ukraine and to the manipulation that Trump and Giuliani and the team went to do. I, I agree with you. But somehow it doesn't look like we're going to get there. And I thank you for your time. Uh, time's, ex I'll yield. time's expired. Chair now recognizes Mr. Biggs from Arizona. He yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Christian Morte for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Parnas, Rudy Giuliani tasked you with, quote, a mission to travel the globe to find dirt to damage the Biden's reputation in the 2018-2019 time frame, right? Correct, yes. And this was in an effort to secure Trump's uh, Re-election re as president in 2020, right? Correct. Yes. And by dirt, you mean evidence of wrongdoing or criminality, right? Yes, sir. And in your travels, you found, quote, precisely zero proof of the Biden's criminality, right? Correct. And there was no evidence of the Biden's corruption in Ukraine because, as you said, there truly was none, right? Correct. Yes, sir. Now, interestingly, you have looked for dirt around the world about the Bidens and specifically Joe Biden in particular, and you say the FBI, CIA, NSA have all failed to produce any evidence of criminal wrongdoing, right? Correct. Not only that, but former Ukrainian President Poro, Petro Poroshenko stated, quote, there's not a single word of truth to these allegations about Joe Biden, right? Absolutely, yes, sir. Now, there's a guy named Yuri Lutsenko, who's the former prosecutor general of Ukraine, and he also, quote, confirmed that nothing ties the Bidens to criminal activity in Ukraine, right? Correct. And then there's another prosecutor general named Viktor Shokin, who also said, he conceded, quote, they had, that he had no evidence that either Joe or Hunter Biden had ever interfered with Ukrainian law, right? Yes, sir. And the reason you know this is because you talked to each of these people, right? Yes, sir. And your, your job was to try to dig up dirt or manufacture dirt, right? Yes, sir. And yet we have conducted months of hearings. And because there's been no evidence of wrongdoing, you've called this whole impeachment inquiry a, quote, wild goose chase, right? Yes, sir. Now, interestingly, we've heard from the other side that, quote, the real quid pro quo wasn't, wasn't Donald Trump. It was Joe Biden when he tried to hold up foreign aid when he was vice president in exchange for firing the federal prosecutor in Ukraine that was investigating the corruption from his son. Now, you, again, looked for evidence to support this claim. There is no evidence, correct? Correct. That was false. In fact, firing the prosecutor would make it more likely that they would go after the company in question, Burisma, not less, right? Well, the ironic part is the reason why majority of the world and Ukraine and the Obama administration wanted to fire, get rid of Viktor Shokin because he was corrupt, not because he was investigating Burisma, because he was stalling investigations for UK that was looking into a $23 million they wanted to get out from, uh, 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 from Zlochevsky, and Shokin uh, stalled that investigation. So it was just, the logic is just the opposite of or, what the majority claims is to be the case, namely yes. that they say that somehow Joe Biden was out to fire the prosecutor to reduce the chances of a prosecution of Burisma. But actually in firing that prosecutor, he increased the chances of in prosecuting Burisma, right? Absolutely correct, yes. So let me just talk to you about what some of the other witnesses in this impeachment inquiry have said. Jonathan Turley, the constitutional expert the Republicans brought forward said, there's no evidence of which he was aware to support impeaching the president. You agree with that, correct? 100%. Garrett Graves, a colleague of ours, said just last week, quote, have I seen anything that is impeachable? No, I haven't. You agree with that statement as well? Yes, sir. Last year, our Republican colleague, Ken Buck, who's about to retire, said he, <laughs> that evidence of wrongdoing by President Biden, quote, doesn't exist right now. It doesn't exist now. It didn't exist then, right? That's exactly true, sir. Sir, how many times have you met Donald Trump? Uh, well over 10 times, I'd say. I don't <laughs> I'd have to count, but lots of times. Is there anything that you'd like to relate to us about your conversations with Donald Trump that would bear on the uh, conduct of these proceedings? I mean, Donald Trump was aware of everything that was going on on that day in the Red Room when we were in uh, the uh, White House. 
after Rudy bringing Donald Trump up to speed on uh, that I could go out to Ukraine and get Viktor Shokin. Donald Trump approached me, shook my head, said thank you for all that you're doing, keep up the good work, patted me on the back, took pictures, and I was off to Ukraine. To meet with Viktor Shokin? To, to find Viktor Shokin, to bring him back here to meet with Lindsey Graham. Got it. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Cloud from Texas for five minutes. Chair now recognizes Ms. Brown from Ohio for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing is another unfortunate attempt by my Republican colleagues to muddy the water in an election year with no proof, no evidence, no wrongdoing at all by President Biden. The American people are tired of this charade. 
As I said before, my Republican colleagues simply grasp at straws that do not exist. While House Democrats in the Biden-Harris administration work to cut costs of prescription drugs, expand student loan forgiveness, and mitigate the threat of gun violence, Republican members of Congress continue to chase after Russian disinformation campaigns from the 2020 election, which have been thoroughly debunked again and again. And as usual, in this committee, we know who is in charge. It is the bondless, broke bluffer, twice impeached, four times indicted, insurrection initiator, election denying, self-declared dictator on day one, and puppet for Putin. The one who wants to terminate the Constitution and defund the FBI. The one who romanticized exchanging of love letters with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. The one who just last week embraced autocrat Orban of Hungary to discuss their diabolical plans to destroy our democracy. The one who proposed a policy to ban Muslims from this country. The one who just this week said any Jewish person who votes for a Democrat hates their religion and Israel. The one who called neo-Nazis carrying tiki torches tanting Jews will not replace us good people. The one who referred to African nations as, I quote, shithole countries. The one who called NFL players, the majority whom are black, sons of bitches for taking a knee in protest of the ever-present racial inequality and police brutality that continues to pervade our justice system. The one who called Mexicans rapists and promised to build a wall and have them pay for it, and in case you missed it, it didn't happen. The one who told women of color from the United, born in the United States, elected to Congress and serving on this very committee to go back to their own countries. The one who bragged about grabbing women by their private parts. The one who confused his rape victim, whom he claimed was not his type, for his very own ex-wife. The one who is an admitted and committed adulterer, who attempted to pay off a porn star for her silence. The one who has publicly mocked people with disabilities. The one who dodged the draft and referred to prisoners of war as losers, the very people who pay a high price so we can enjoy the freedoms that far too many of us take for granted. The one who boasted about being able to stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue to shoot some and shoot someone and not lose votes. The one who promoted political and physical violence multiple times, including most recently at my rally in the home state, my home state of Ohio, where he declared there would be a bloodbath if he didn't win. The one who intentionally denied COVID was deadly and eventually suggested testing injecting bleach into our bodies to kill the respiratory virus that took the lives of one million people in the United States. The one who ordered his son-in-law get top secret security clearance overruling concerns flagged by intelligence officials who according to this committee's chairman admitted the former president's son-in-law crossed the line of ethics by accepting a two billion dollar investment into that very same son-in-law's fledgling firm only six months after leaving the White House. If any of this sounds crazy, it's because it is. This might sound unbelievable, but it's all true. These are facts, indisputable facts a thing that is known and proven to be true. This may be a foreign concept to some of my colleagues, but for those of us who still have a relationship with the truth, please know this is not an exhaustive list of inappropriate, unethical, and questionable behavior by the maniacal manipulator of Mar-a-Lago because I could go on, but I only have five minutes. Yet here we are again, trying to make sense out of nonsense. I would humbly, respectfully ask my Republican and colleagues on this committee to stop falling over yourselves to win the approval of one because millions of people are depending on you to defend our delicate democracy. And with that, I yield the remainder of my time to Ch Chair Dale. The, the ranking member. Oh, I don't know that there's much time left, but thank you for that eloquent and compressed recitation of um, some of what we've lived with over the last few years. Chair recognizes Mr. Letourner from Kansas for five minutes. Mr. Bobulinski, I want to talk about May of 2017. To be clear, Hunter Biden was doing business with CEFC while his dad was VP. Are you aware of that now? Yes. 
Rob Walker told us that during his trans told us that during his transcribed interview before the committee. But I want to talk to you about your meeting with Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, and Jim Biden in May of 2017. Other members are going to bring up the meeting you had with Joe Biden at the Beverly Hilton the night before the Milken Conference, but I want to talk about the next day when you win as Joe Biden's guest to the Milken Conference. So, you watched Joe Biden deliver a speech that day. Then you had a follow-up conversation with Joe Biden. Isn't that correct? Correct. What did Joe Biden tell you during that conversation? Well, as I've already publicly uh, shared, you know, I was brought backstage by his team um, because he had just given his keynote and you know, we just exchanged pleasantries and then I walked him out to his car and he specifically thanked me for the work I was doing with his son and his brother and asked me to keep an eye on them. And my understanding is, Mr. Bobolinsky, that after Joe Biden had left, you went across the street to the Peninsula Hotel and had a long conversation with his brother, Jim Biden. Isn't that correct? I did. It's my understanding that you asked him how the Biden family does the business that they do, while Joe Biden is such a prominent political figure. What was Jim Biden's response to you? Correct. I was actually concerned and asking from a position of concern, and Jim Biden's response to me was plausible deniability. Plausible deniability. And by that you mean Joe Biden would be kept in the loop, but you weren't supposed to talk about it, especially in writing. Mr. Galanis, during your transcribed interview with the committees, you said a very interesting phrase. Say it, forget it, write it, regret it. Does this sound familiar? Is this consistent with your understanding of how the Bidens do business, Mr. Galanis? Yeah, very, very much so. That was not writing principle, yes. But it looks like someone made a mistake. Mr. Bobolinsky, you created two companies with the Bidens. I want to show you an infamous email discussing the ownership structure of one of those companies, CEFC. You can see on the screen, 20% for H, 20% for Rob Walker, 20% for James Gilliar, 20% for Tony Bobolinsky, 10% for Jim Biden, and 10% held by H for the, quote, big guy. Mr. Bobolinsky, who is the big guy? The big guy is 100% Joe Biden. Mr. Bobolinsky, Hunter Biden didn't respond saying, knock it off. We can't include Joe Biden, did he? No, and that's actually a critical point because remember... Mr. Bobolinsky, did, did you ever get a text message or a group text message or anything like that saying, guys, knock it off. Joe Biden isn't involved in this deal. No, the whistleblowers actually have a text exchange where they're talking about everything else but that. And the reason why they weren't talking about it is because everyone knew... Joe Biden was the big guy. Hunter Biden begged for a public hearing, but it turns out he is too afraid of accountability to show up and tell the truth to the American people. But Americans don't need Hunter's testimony to know they are being gaslit by this president. It's blatantly obvious to anyone paying attention that Joe Biden is the big guy. The CEFC deal broke the say it, forget it, write it, regret it rule of the Biden family businesses and now they are trying to cover it up. Joe Biden said repeatedly that his family never made a dime from China. But Mr. Bobolinsky just confirmed that Hunter, Jim, and the big guy himself all got a cut from the CEFC China energy deal. Let me be clear. The only service the Biden family ever provided was their ability to leverage the office of the Vice President of the United States to cash in overseas. My Democrat colleagues, are going to try and tell you that Joe Biden wasn't on the final ownership structure agreement. But isn't it true? If someone was holding Joe Biden's stake in the company, it wouldn't appear in the document. Isn't that the whole point of this email, to hold hold Joe Biden's stake so his name wouldn't be in the document? Isn't this just plausible deniability in action, Mr. uh, Bobolinsky? It appears that way. But plausible deniability only gets you so far. Now, I want to fast forward from May to the end of July of 2017 when the Bidens cut you out of the deal. I want to show you a message that Hunter sent to his Chinese business partners. Please put it up on the screen. Hunter writes, quote, I am sitting here with my father and we would like to understand why the commitment made has not been fulfilled. So, when Hunter Biden is desperate for money, Jim Biden's old trick of plausible deniability doesn't cut it. And when desperate times call for desperate measures, Hunter Biden let the cat out of the bag, said the quiet part out loud, and gave the game away by calling on his father to help him shake down his Chinese business partners for the money. And it worked. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, just point of inquiry. What was the last image we saw 
uh, did you put up? Where did that come from? I just want to authenticate that. Uh, this is the Ways and Means, Means Committee Exhibit 300. Must be the IRS whistleblower note. Uh, not an inquiry, though. Anyway, uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Stansberry for the last question. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to the GOP's day-long campaign for Donald Trump. Uh, I want to start with Mr. Galanis to help connect some dots that have not yet been connected in this hearing. Mr. Galanis, you are serving just under 16 years for, among other things, as has been said today, defrauding a tribal nation and specifically a tribal corporation held by the Ogallala Sioux, which is why you are testifying from a prison today. But I'd like to ask you, Mr. Galanis, have you had an attorney representing you before this committee that you retained last December? And that attorney's name is Mr. Mark Pauletta, correct? That's correct. And when you first testified before this committee in a taped interview, you were actually stopped by Mr. Pauletta from answering just a simple question about how you met him and who exactly was paying your legal fees. Now, I want to make sure that the American people understand exactly who Mr. Pauletta is, because he is, in fact, a former lawyer to Donald Trump, who served in the administration in the Office of Management and Budget, and was at the center of the Ukrainian pressure campaign for which Donald Trump was impeached. And in fact, Mr. Pauletta was Trump's chief OMB lawyer when he withheld aid to Ukraine to try to extort the Ukrainian government into investigating Joe Biden to support Donald Trump's campaign. And Mr. Pauletta literally wrote the memo to help withhold those funds. Now, I want to dig in a little bit on this pressure campaign, and Mr. Lev Parnas is here to discuss as an eyewitness who was there. Mr. Parnas, we appreciate you being here, and I want to move through this quickly, so just ask for simple yes and no answers. You've testified here today that Donald Trump repeatedly asked you and through Rudy Giuliani to put pressure on the Ukrainian government to dig up dirt on Joe Biden to support Trump's campaign, correct? 100% yes. And as we can see here in this picture, you were very much a business associate of Rudy Giuliani during this time. And as established in your testimony, you traveled to and met with Ukrainian officials and told them that the White House would support, would withhold its support and aid to Ukraine if it did not cooperate with this bribery, essentially. That's correct. And as we all know, Donald Trump's administration and specifically the Office of Management and Budget did withhold that foreign aid in 2019. And here's the guy who did it. And he's representing the witness who's literally on Zoom with us for this committee today. And it's the reason why Donald Trump was impeached the first time. And the man at the center of that scheme is involved in the House GOP's inquiry. But I also want to point out that Mr. Pauletta is also involved in and very much in bed with the Thomases. In fact, he represented Miss Jenny Thomas, Clarence Thomas's wife, in her involvement in the Stop the Steal before the January 6th. Uh, committee, and actually also goes on vacation with Mr. Harlan Crow and the Thomases. So this man has quite an interesting roster and uh, participation in this hearing. But the bigger picture here is that Mr. Pauletta's presence is yet another indication of the way in which this hearing and this impeachment inquiry is part of Donald Trump's larger misinformation campaign, just like it was in 2020, where in addition to pressuring and withholding aid to Ukraine, Rudy Giuliani and the Trump Organization, as Mr. Parnas has established, planted the story in the media. And now here we are four years later as they've dredged it back up and are planting it back in the media using Congress using this committee and using a baseless impeachment supported by Donald Trump's own allies on this committee to push that information out. As members on this committee have trafficked in false evidence that was planted by a Russian operative to the FBI and is now in jail for that. 
All of this is in the service of propping up the criminal enterprise for which Donald Trump is at the top and has already been twice impeached. Rudy Giuliani and others have been exposed as they continue to traffic in Russian disinformation that not only props up Donald Trump, but it props up Vladimir Putin himself and his goals back in Russia and in Ukraine. So I just want to point out here that once again, as I said when we had a false impeachment hearing a few months ago, that once again we see the time's long expired, arm, gentle ladies, time's expired. hands of Donald Trump all over this hearing. And and just want to state, you made a mistake and said that uh, Mr. Parnas was a Republican witness. He is very much your witness, not a Republican witness. But I was a Republican for Donald Trump. Mr. Chairman, I do not Pursue believe it. I said that so we can... Pursue it to the previous order. The chair declares the committee in recess due to votes. Uh, subject to the call of the chair, we will reconvene 10 minutes after the three votes. All right.